Capillary electrophoresis is a method of separating out charged species inside a sample by having them migrate through an electric field. In this case, the sample is going towards the cathode. And as the sample is going towards the cathode, it's being detected. So as the charged species are detected, you end up with signal like this. Are you ready to step through a protocol and learn the theory as well as the practice of capillary electrophoresis? Hi friends, my name is Carter and I'm a PhD bioengineer and founder of Sygen.com. My goal with this channel is to teach you new biotechniques so you become a much more well-rounded scientist. And I hope that you go to Sygen.com and search for any biotechnique that you'd like so that you can find free protocols for those techniques and you can apply them towards whatever molecules you study in lab. So if you're ready to be a more well-rounded scientist, click the like button, click subscribe, and ask all the questions you want in the comments below, and I'd be happy to answer them. All right, let's get into it. To understand capillary electrophoresis, you first need to understand electrophoresis. And if you don't really have a background on this, please check out the description below. And I've linked a previous YouTube video where I've explained electrophoresis in great detail, along with a protocol for how you do gel electrophoresis, which is a more simple version of capillary electrophoresis. So for now, let's just cover electrophoresis in brief detail. Here we've got a solution that has positive and negative charges. In electrophoresis, an electric field causes a cathode and an anode to exist. Positive ions inside the solution go towards the cathode, which is negatively charged, and negative ions inside the solution go towards the anode, which is positively charged. In gel electrophoresis, the anode is here, it's positively charged. The cathode is here, it's negatively charged. And we add in samples which are negatively charged into wells inside a gel. These samples are typically proteins in the case of SDS page. In SDS page, the proteins are negatively charged because they have SDS detergent added in and bound. SDS linearizes the proteins and causes them to be separated by size as the SDS protein complexes go through the gel membrane. If SDS page or gel electrophoresis don't make sense at this point, please check out the description below where I've linked YouTube videos that will give you all the background information and theory that you need to understand capillary electrophoresis. In capillary electrophoresis, Samples are separated within a capillary, which is shown here in gray. Just like in normal electrophoresis, positive samples go towards the cathode and negative samples go towards the anode. The only difference is here there's no gel, there's an injector, which is how the samples get into the capillary. And inside the capillary, there's a lot of buffer. By having samples travel through the capillary via an electroosmotic force and an electrophoretic force, we're able to see samples move. I'm going to explain these two concepts later. Just remember that samples are going towards the cathode or the anode depending on their charge. And look here, as samples pass through this line, they're detected via a detector. Let's now look a little bit deeper at this capillary because there's a lot going on here. So first, what is an electrophoretic force? Like I said previously, in electrophoresis, positive ions will migrate towards the cathode and negative ions will migrate towards the anode. This is electrophoresis or the electrophoretic force. Now inside a capillary, the walls have silane groups. These are the SIO labels in this diagram. In normal polarity runs, these silane groups have positive cations that are in this area, which is called the diffuse layer. Inside the diffuse layer, the cations are moving towards the cathode. And because of this, they drag all of this other liquid along with them. This is why this is called the electroosmotic force. Electro meaning it's because of this electric field. Osmotic because 
it's the liquid itself that's moving because of the electric field. And because of this phenomenon, what happens is liquid that is right here at the interface between the capillary and the buffer doesn't really move. Liquid that's here inside the diffuse zone moves because of the electroosmotic force, but it's slower because of fluid dynamics. Liquid that's here in the bulk moves faster, and in the normal polarity mode, the bulk of the liquid moves towards the cathode. We'll describe what reverse polarity and normal polarity mean later. But what you need to understand right now is that there are two forces that are in play. One is the electroosmotic force, which in this case goes in this direction. And the other is the electrophoretic force, which goes in either this direction or that direction, depending on the charge of the ion that you're looking at. And in the end, the data that you get looks kind of like this. You see signal as well as time. And what this means is, as our sample is going past the detector, you're seeing a peak. So in this case, some ion peaked first, then another ion showed up, and then a third ion showed up as it was going past the detector. All right, now that we understand the theory, let's get into the practice and go through a protocol that's on J-O-V-E. In this protocol, we're gonna look at what are the constituents of diet Pepsi versus normal Pepsi. So step one is of course to turn on the instrument. That's easy. Step two is to make sure that the temperature of the sample and the cartridge is set properly. The temperature affects how easy it is for the liquid to flow, and we wanna make sure that the same temperature is used across many different runs. So let's set it at a standard 35C. Additionally, you can see here, we're setting a UV detection wavelength. This is because our detector is a UV detector in this protocol, and it's going to measure samples via double bonds at this 214 nanometer wavelength. Finally, the third step is to write a program which consists of rinse steps. And inside the rinse steps, we're gonna be doing an NaOH rinse as well as a run buffer rinse, which is borate buffer. Let's take a look at what this actually means. So here's our instrument. We're gonna first turn it on. Okay, there should be some power here. Let's, let's just color that in. Okay, the power is on. We're now going to put our sample here, and we're gonna put an outlet sample here. You can see inlet and outlet are labeled. Inside, there's a capillary that connects the inlet and the outlet, and there's an electric field that causes samples. Remember, the electroosmotic force is moving samples from the inlet to the outlet, and there's actually an injector that's going to come in and pick up samples from our inlet and inject it into our capillary. This voltage should turn on once we've loaded all of our samples. And in this case, we're running normal polarity. Just remember that that means all the bulk liquid is flowing towards the cathode. So when we do our rinse, it said that the first rinse is with sodium hydroxide. What that means is we're gonna inject sodium hydroxide in. And this is gonna cause all of our silane groups to deprotonate. The next rinse was with borate buffer. When we add the borate buffer, again, we inject it in, and borate buffer is gonna make it so that there's buffer lining the entire capillary. 
and all of our silane groups are properly protonated and our diffuse layer is set up properly for normal polarity capillary electrophoresis. The next step of our protocol is to set up all of our samples. There's nothing really noteworthy here except that, look at this, all of our samples are at really low concentrations. And that's the beauty of capillary electrophoresis. One of the main advantages is that you don't need a lot of sample to be able to detect it. And every run is maybe about five to six minutes. So it's really quick technique for quickly separating out charred species. Once again, this is all part of the JOVE protocol, and I've got that linked in the description. All right, so step three is to actually do the electrophoresis. And what's shown here is that we're gonna inject using some pressure. The injector needs some pressure. There's also ways of injecting without pressure, but we're not gonna really cover that here. And after we inject the samples, you can see here, there's a positive 20 kilovolt electric field. The time is really short, it's only five minutes, and we're running in normal polarity. Now we've been talking about normal polarity for a long time, and I really wanna explain it here. So first, take a look at this equation at the bottom here. The total velocity of the liquid, which is the bulk liquid, inside a capillary is based on the two forces I talked about, electrophoretic force and electroosmotic force. Let's look at the electrophoretic force and the electroosmotic force individually. Here you can see we've got a cation and we've got an anion. And when you look at just the electrophoretic force, remember that cations go towards the cathode and anions go towards the anode. That's the electrophoretic force. Now, what is this? This is the electroosmotic force. So because we've got all these cations at the diffuse layer that are moving slowly towards the cathode, that means that even a neutral species that's inside the liquid it's gonna slowly make its way over to the cathode. That's the electroosmotic force. It's the force that causes the bulk liquid to move towards the cathode in normal polarity mode. So what this means is that if you just look at a cation, it has the electrophoretic force and it has the electroosmotic force summed up to make it move really quickly towards that cathode. And the anions that are in solution, typically they would move really quickly towards the anode. But because of this electroosmotic force, we had to shorten the two vectors. And this is the sum of the two vectors which determines how quickly an anion will move in this solution. I hope this makes sense. So cations are gonna move really quickly towards the cathode. Anions are gonna move really slowly towards the anode because the electroosmotic force plus the electrophoretic force add up to the total velocity of the bulk liquid. And here is normal polarity mode. You can see the bulk is all moving towards the cathode. Also, what's noteworthy is that we've got cations that are in the diffuse layer. This is important because when you switch it to reverse polarity, in reverse polarity, we not only change the direction of the electric field, so instead of positive 20 kilovolts, we might make it negative 20 kilovolts. Plus, we change the diffuse layer to have anions, in which case the bulk liquid goes towards the anode. I hope you now understand the difference between normal polarity and reverse polarity capillary electrophoresis. And in this protocol, we're running normal polarity 
capillary electrophoresis. Here's the fourth step in the JOVE protocol. And you can see there's nothing much noteworthy here. You're going to have multiple sets of samples. So in this case, we're going to be running some soda samples. Remember, diet versus non-diet Pepsi. And also, we're going to have borate run buffer and sodium hydroxide rinse solution as some of the inputs because we're going to be rinsing our capillary in between each of the runs. That's about it. And here's the final data from the JOVE protocol. As you can see here, we actually ran multiple samples. First, we ran just caffeine. And caffeine gave a peak here at 2.6 minutes. Then we ran aspartame. And aspartame, just by itself, gave a peak here at 3.4 minutes. And finally, we ran benzoic acid, which gave a peak here at roughly 4.3 minutes. Then we ran diet Pepsi and we saw three different peaks all together. And each of the peaks corresponded to one of the individual components that we ran. So this is a really good way of showing what are the components of Diet Pepsi. One thing I didn't mention before is that each of these peaks, the area under the curve actually corresponds to the concentration of that component inside the solution. And within this JOVE article, they actually show you how to make a standard curve and how to analyze the concentration of each component within your sample. All right, friends, I hope you really enjoyed that tutorial. By subscribing to this channel, you're going to be learning a lot more techniques, just like capillary electrophoresis. So go ahead and click that red subscribe button. Also, if you liked this tutorial, please click the like and ask any of your questions down below in the comment section. Looking forward to chatting with you again. Happy sciencing.